Hi there. My name is Aaron Landerman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And in a previous lecture of guitar amplification and effects, we looked at tone controls in amplifiers where capacitors played a starring role. But capacitors appear all over the place in guitar amplifiers, but I've mostly just ignored those other capacitors. And those other capacitors got together and they protested and said that I should give them some attention. So in this week's lectures, we'll take a look at those capacitors and either justify ignoring them or talk about their tone shaping properties when they do appear. So I'm going to use some frequency analysis techniques on the common cathode amplifier. And you can take some of these ideas and apply them to other amplifier configurations. We've spent a lot of time looking at the common cathode amplifier. It was basically the first amplifier stage that we studied in depth. So VN is our input, RG is our grid leak resistor, RK is our cathode resistance, and if we're using the possibility of bypassing the cathode with this cathode bypass capacitor, I'm also including the possibility of putting some resistance in series with it. This isn't very common, but it does show up in things like the Mesa Boogie Dual Rectifier that we've looked at a lot, so I want to include it. What I've called RL here is something that's a fundamental part of the amplifier stage. Other textbooks will call this big R, little p, and I like to use L here because I want to make sure we don't get this confused with little r sub little p, which is the dynamic plate resistance. Something new you haven't seen before, at least in my lectures, is this bypass capacitor for the plate. This isn't terribly common, but it does show up in some of the later preamp stages in the Mesa Boogie Dual Rectifier, so I do want to talk about that, but we'll mostly save that for a couple lectures from now. This capacitance is actually a parameter in the voice architecture of the Fractal Audio Amp Modeling Platform. So, if you own an Axe FX3 or an FM9 or an FM3, check back in a few days and we'll talk about that. The EL here stands for external load, and this represents the input impedance of the next stage of the amplifier. Usually this is another grid leak resistor, but it could also be some approximation to the impedance of a tone stack. Of course, the tone stack will have some sort of complicated reactance, but people will often approximate it using some kind of resistance when doing the kinds of calculations I'm about to describe. Connecting this common cathode stage and whatever the next stage of the amplifier is, is a coupling capacitor that I call CO. I guess O stands for output. I don't know. I needed to call it something. I didn't want to call it CC. In this lecture, I would like to channel my inner Adam Neely and look at the Please. response of the circuit. So let us interrogate each of these capacitors about its role. So we know that the coupling capacitor is here to block DC, so it certainly is going to play a role in the base response. Now let's think about the capacitor down here. Remember that increasing the cathode resistance decreases the gain. So the more that this capacitor is conducting, the less impedance you have here, the more gain you have and this capacitor is going to conduct more at higher frequencies. So the net effect of this capacitor is to have higher gain at higher frequencies. Now, this is not affecting a strict high pass effect the way the coupling capacitor is. The cathode capacitor here is basically creating a high pass shelving effect. So that's the story of the cathode bypass capacitor. What about this plate bypass capacitor? Well, as you increase the frequency, this starts to look more and more like a short. This load resistor here is getting shorted out. And as far as the signal is concerned, it's being shorted to AC ground. As a result, higher frequencies essentially get grounded out. So this has a low pass filtering effect. And so this is playing a role in the trouble response. So we will look at the capacitor CP in another lecture. And for now, we'll just get rid of it. Now, we could compute the transfer function, including both of these capacitors. 
but that would be fairly tedious, and it would also give us a formula that would be fairly unintuitive. So here I'm going to use an approach called the method of short circuit time constants for approximating the low frequency behavior of circuits. So in this method, you basically examine the capacitors mostly responsible for the low frequency response one at a time. And when you're focusing on a particular capacitor, you short out the others. So since we're focusing on CO in this lecture, I'm going to short out CK. A little bit later, I'll hand wave to try to motivate this approach a little bit. So since I've shorted out CK, I can replace RK in parallel with RKC with its parallel combination, which I'll call RK with a superscript AC. And this is a notation that I used in a previous lecture. And in that previous lecture, I think at some point I actually dropped the superscript AC notation. Here I'm going to keep it because we'll do some derivations over the next couple of days. We're making the distinction between RK and RKC and RK superscript AC will be helpful. Now I want to study the small signal circuit. So I'm going to replace the VPP up here with the small signal quote unquote AC ground. All right. The AC here inside the triode now means that this triode symbol is representing our small signal model. And our general technique in this class has been to not use the small signal model directly, but instead use a Thevenin equivalent circuit. You might want to go rewatch our lecture on Thevenin equivalent circuits for tubes as a review. So, if we were to suppose that the frequency was extremely high so that you could represent this as a short, we might compute the transfer function by saying, okay, well, we have a voltage input. It's getting multiplied by the raw gain of the tube mu. The overall structure of the amplifier is inverting, so we have a minus sign. But we don't get this voltage directly. We see it through a voltage divider. And here I've created a convenient notation called RACL. That's RL in parallel with REL, which would be reasonable to do if this was actually shorted. So our voltage is being divided across RACL, so that's on top. And then in the denominator, we have the series combination of RACL, RP, the dynamic plate resistance, and RKAC. But times this mu plus one term we get from looking down into the plate of the tube in terms of seeing the resistance looking out of the cathode on the other side. I've called that high frequency gain A subscript infinity, and this is the sort of formula that we've computed and used previously. Now, at DC, this cap is open, so the output is basically just hooked to ground, so you get nothing out at DC. So we can guess what the form of the generic transfer function of the system is. It's going to be this A sub infinity times a canonical high pass response. So if I plug in J omega for the S parameters here, and then let omega go to infinity, this entire term goes to one, and I get A sub infinity. So the name of the game now is to figure out what omega sub O is, and I picked O here to match the O in the subscript here. It will be convenient to divide the numerator and the denominator here by omega O, and then rewrite it in terms of time constants, tau O, where tau O is equal to 1 over omega O. So to compute the time constant, we first zero the independent sources. So we set V into zero, which effectively gets rid of this source here, and we wind up with this. And then we imagine taking some wire cutters and clipping out the capacitor and replacing it with an ohmmeter to measure the resistance looking into the rest of the circuit from the point of view of the capacitor. So to better see what's going on, let me explicitly draw lines connecting the grounds. So if I think about looking out of CO going this direction, I'll see REL 
and then I'll see that in series. So that's why I have a plus sign down here. This parallel combination of RL up here with RP plus this mu plus one RK superscript AC. Now, that looks awfully complicated, but this expression here is not something new. This is something we've seen before. This is the output impedance of a common cathode amplifier looking in this direction, not including this load resistance. And I have to be careful to remember to multiply by the capacitance. For a specific example, let's return to our case study of the Mesa Boogie dual rectifier, yet again looking at the first stage. Now, the thing to remember is that the first stage of the Mesa Boogie dual rectifier can actually be switched into two different modes. There's an RK of 1.8 kilo ohm, but there is a low gain mode that includes an RKC of 47 kilo ohm, but that can be bypassed using a light dependent resistor being used as a switch, in which case that parameter equals zero. Our CO is 20 nanofarads, RL is 220 kilo ohms, and what about REL? Well, that's representing all of this stuff over here. And in order to compute a value for that, you have to make an assumption of these switches being set a certain way and then decide what caps to ignore and how to ignore them. We did some of that in a previous lecture and computed a value of 899 kilo ohms, which I guess you could round to 900 kilo ohms. In any case, that's an assumed value that I'm just going to use here. So I'm going to have to compute our time constant for two cases. One, the lower gain case, where RK in parallel with RKC is 1.7 kilo ohm, and the other case where basically RKC is zero, so that parallel combination is zero. Let's check out the lower gain case first. Substituting in the values we have, we see that I wind up with this term in brackets here, the dynamic plate resistance of 72 kilo ohms plus 101 times 1.7 kilo ohm for my RKAC. The dynamic plate resistance of 72 kilo ohm is something we computed in a previous lecture. And mu of 100, well, that's just the standard value for 12AX7. All of the stuff in brackets here turns out to be on the order of the load resistor. And when you compare that parallel combination to the REL term, you'll find that the REL term pretty much dominates. So we wind up with something that's around omega ohm times 20 nanofarad, giving us a time constant of around 20 milliseconds. Taking the reciprocal of that and dividing by 2 pi gives me a cutoff frequency of 7.8 hertz. So the lowest note on an electric guitar in standard tuning is the low E, which is around 82 hertz. And so even if you're talking about using a bass guitar, I guess that would be around 41 hertz because that's an octave lower. And even if you're tuning down a little bit, in any case, this is well below the range of audio that we're worried about. Well, what about that high gain setting? For the high gain setting, RKAC is zero, so this term here disappears. And we wind up with 220 kilo ohm in parallel with 72 kilo ohm. So that's something like 54.2 kilo ohm, but that's now really getting swamped by this REL term here. And I wind up with a time constant of 19.1 milliseconds, so around what we had before. And taking the reciprocal of that and dividing by 2 pi, the corner frequency goes up to 8.3 hertz. So it barely changed, again, because REL is so big relative to everything else. So we can conclude that at least for that first preamp stage on the Mesa Boogie, this coupling capacitor isn't playing a musical role. But just because it doesn't play a serious tone shaping role there doesn't mean it can't play a tone shaping role if you chose a different capacitor.
If you're designing an app and you find that it sounds too fumbly grumbly and you expect the reason is that the second stage is having some odd distortion coming from too much bass coming in, well, then you might decrease the value of this capacitor in order to decrease that time constant and increase the cutoff frequency to help roll off some of those problematic bass frequencies going into the next stage. Before we wrap up, let me see if I can motivate the shorting part of the short circuit time constant method a little bit. So we were focusing on this capacitor here, and I said, let's short this capacitor here. Let's imagine what would happen if instead we open this capacitor. Well, then the only resistance we have down here would be RK. So RKAC would basically just be RK it would be a bigger number. So the cutoff frequency here would be lower. So that would be more optimistic if you're thinking from a traditional electrical engineering amplifier design standpoint, you generally want to have a wide bandwidth amplifier and you would want to pass those low frequencies. So by shorting this capacitor here, you're deliberately going for the most pessimistic estimate of FO. So in this lecture, we explore the effect of CO by shorting CK. In the next lecture, we'll explore the effect of CK using the method of short circuit time constants by shorting CO.